Okay, and we are recording. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Today, I'm excited to be able to talk to Dr. Jerry Crete, um, who is on the other side of the country <laughs> from me, but thanks to technology, we can do this. <laughs> um, and I guess before we jump into today's topic, but um, Dr. Jerry, do you want to uh, introduce yourself a little bit and talk about Yeah, that? sure, sure. Hey there. Um, yeah, I am uh, Jerry Creed. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and professional counselor in the state of Georgia. Uh, I'm also, uh, I also do, uh, I run uh, Souls and Hearts, which is a uh, website which has blogs, podcasts, and courses. And I do a weekly podcast called Be With the Word. And we actually have a course on there related to um, uh, pornography addiction with couples. Uh, so that's why, uh, so I thought I'd mention that course given, uh, our topic today. Nice. That's, that's good to know. And, and you also mentioned you were the past president of the Catholic Psychotherapist Association. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I've been on the board for the Catholic Psychotherapy Association for a number of years now. And, uh, last year I was the president. And, uh, so it's a great organization for therapists mm -hmm. of all kinds, uh, and counselors, um who are catholic and want to be united in their faith and grow together and do they have a directory because i have people from all different states contacting me and usually i can only provide it within my state of licensure so i'm trying to point them in different directions do they is there a list that people could access? oh yeah yeah if you go to the cpa website catholic psychotherapy well if you can include it in your yeah. uh tagline or something but um we do have the Catholic Psychotherapy Association website has a directory and it lists all the therapists who wanted to be identified to be um, possibly called upon. Um, there's also a website called catholictherapist.com, uh, which provides uh, a listing of Catholic therapists as well. Yeah. Yeah. And those, those are great resources because sometimes people, especially if they're looking for telehealth right now, they they don't know what kind of right. the, the rules are but going by state is usually like a safer approach to find somebody in your safe or your state yeah yeah, yeah. so those are helpful cool uh oh froze <laughs> um let's see so yeah we, we with covid and everything i've been i spend probably half my day online now yeah 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 yeah, telehealth is really taking off. Um, okay, let's see. I think it's it's freezing a little bit, um, but okay. hopefully not too much. That should be okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, cool. So, um, so today's topic, and it sounds like this is something that that you um, work with a lot, and and so I'm I'm really excited to to kind of hear your approach and. Um, I listened to a little bit of your talk, I think it was with Matt Frad on this issue, um, but, you know, we're talking about pornography addiction um, and, and the intimacy side of it too, um, which is really important. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier, but I, I work with uh, teens in the ministry setting out here, and I also work in the therapy setting with a lot of teens, young adults. Um, and when it comes to porn, I think there is just there's almost like an overwhelming nature of it that it's that is rampant um and exposure um and even the the teens in ministry that i've seen that, that come from solid households that parents are like you know what we're going to be very careful with what you're exposed to we're going to limit access to different things um i've had teens come to me and say you know adam i'm i can't stop watching porn <laughs> and part of me is like wow, how did you, <laughs> how did you get access? You know, like, because they're, these are even some parents who are very aware of the, the ease of access to these things. Um, so, so kind of what I, I thought we could start with and, and I want to ask you is, you know, what other factors do you see in, in porn being so rampant besides kind of just like it's at our fingertips, you know, what, what draws people, um, but especially younger people to this, um, what are some of those factors? Well, let's just start by saying, I mean, we are created to be attracted, you know, to, to the opposite sex, to we're, we're, we're designed to be, um, sexual beings, right? I mean, that's, 
that's how we were created. Our brains are wired that way to notice certain things, to be attracted, to have an, uh, us, our bodies be stimulated and aroused. So the fact that you, one gets aroused um, by, by sexual material shouldn't surprise anybody, right? <laughs> Um, and, and the reality is in the past, right, um, it was rare to find sexual material, you know, people, when I say the past, I don't know, I'm going to, let's go back, you know, like 50, 60 years ago or something. I mean, people dress more modestly, mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, even advertisements in magazines were not as explicit, um, let alone full, you know, um, hardcore pornography. <laughs> so um, there's going to be a natural curiosity and a natural drive and desire to get to know, understand, you know, uh, one's sexuality and so on. So it's a normal physiological response. Um, but when you take that and you make it so accessible mm -hmm. to a young audience, then you really kind of conditioning them and training them um, to, to be addicted, which is really different because what happens normally is, okay, yeah, as you, like, let me just say the average guy, I don't know, let's, let's just pick a time period. Let's say the 1940s or something, or 1950s, wouldn't have had access to hardcore pornography. <laughs> Obviously would have seen attractive people and been, you know, been looking at them and maybe fantasizing, maybe being aroused and so on. It's sort of a normal attraction, right? But then that would have been paired with, you know, through a process of courting and dating and getting to know someone, paired with uh, a connection, you know, uh, intimacy of some kind, right? Being known, being seen, being, sharing your life, hearing another. There would have been this whole process of, of intimacy. And then the um, sexual kind of expressions, right? I mean, there, maybe there could be hand-holding or kissing or some things like that, but full-blown sexual expression was reserved for marriage, you know, or in some cases prior to marriage, but, but, it, but it was seen, it, it went along with this growth in intimacy and then, it, and then it was tied up with a commitment, right? So you know where I'm going, <laughs> right? We have this generation getting Hard, I would say hardcore pornography. I mean, really uh, access, we're not talking about, like when I was a kid, it would have been a Playboy magazine in some friend's house or something, right? It would have been an image. It wouldn't have been uh, hardcore. And so now it's really quite different with no intimacy and no connection whatsoever. So there's a real gulf between sexual arousal and human intimacy uh, more and more. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very true. So the the culture has shifted where <clears throat> there's more access and there's more even severity of the types of, of pornography available and mm -hmm. our our social um potential to <laughs> be intimate has has lessened a lot, right? I mean, I, I <clears throat> like the teens in ministry, they really struggle to like talk to girls or to ask them out or to have anything that looks like courtship, right? Other than like, I'm going to text you or, you know, DM you on Instagram type of thing. And that, that really isn't fulfilling, right? Like in, in any way, as far as intimacy goes. So that, that really makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. How? <clears throat> okay. Well, no, I was just to that point. Um, that's a different level of connection. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I try to be somewhat open-minded to what it means to be connected, you know, virtually, yeah. um, rather than just simply take the position that it's, it's bad and it's pointless or it doesn't yes. have any meaning. I think it has meaning. Mm -hmm. I just think it is, and I actually think kids today are over-connected. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, you know, I'm making a judgment here, perhaps superficially, Mm -hmm. But maybe they're overconnected um, without really bodies present, <laughs> right? And so it changes, what, you know, you're not really discovering who you are mm -hmm. in the same way when it's never in person or rarely in person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a disembodied, mm -hmm. constant connection. Mm -hmm. 
which to me is really interesting. I mean, I don't, it'll be interesting to see what they're saying in 20 years, <laughs> you know, like you know, how this has affected us. Mm-hmm. Cause I honestly can't even imagine it. I mean, I grew up, you know, with a, one phone in the house attached to a, a cord. <laughs> Um, there was just, there was no sense in which we were constantly chatting on the phone or texting or constant. In fact, there's a lot of times I, I can recall being bored. I almost, now I, I wish I could be so bored. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be nice <clears throat> to have some boredom. <laughs> no, that, yeah. that makes sense. You know, it's, they are, they are constantly connected. Um, and, but there, there isn't really the incarnational aspect to it that they can't experience somebody or really just be in the presence of somebody physically which makes a huge difference um you know especially in courtship i mean just like um experiencing that person getting to know them um you know you're right text they they can share thoughts they can share feelings they can uh, share gifts or gifs um (laughs) but you know they're they're not really sharing that experience as much as of being together um so it, it's a it's a whole different dynamic, but um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, one of the areas that I'm really interested in, and I'm sure you've studied it as well at some point in your in your graduate work, if not since, is this attachment theory. I really ground a lot of the way I think about um, this in attachment theory, which is the idea that as human beings, we uh, long for a, a secure attachment. That means we're connected with someone, and, you know, different, you know, various someones in a way that is safe, you know, where we're able to be vulnerable, we're able to give and receive empathy, where mm-hmm. we know that we're protected with somebody else. Really that we're ultimately, we're truly seen, we're truly known, we're valued. I mean, all these things, this is what we all need as human beings at our core is to be intimate and connected. Um, obviously, if we're in the married state, that's with our, our, our um, spouse, um, but with our family members, with our friends, with, with, you know, um, with others. And we've created a situation, uh, I think, where there's a lot of intimacy in a way and a lot of connection, but it's all like we were saying, disembodied. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's artificial in some way where we can actually um, even pretend to be someone else or act in a way other than ourselves that we can, yeah. you know, and, and we don't actually know. Or we'll, my fear is that we're losing the ability to be truly present. I love that you use the word incarnational. Mm-hmm. I think that speaks to it perfectly. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously this is just occurring to me now, but I mean, if Christ had decided to come, you know, and decide, well, I'll just, you know, text an emoji of myself, right? <laughs> That that wouldn't have been at all as impactful. <laughs> yeah. He were not, yeah. he didn't come as a virtual Christ. He came as a yeah. human in person. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And and you think about it, and <clears throat> I guess not to go off too much into the digital world, but there is kind of like a almost like a anxiety in trying to hyper analyze and hyper interpret our own thoughts as we put them in a text or somebody else's, you know, um, messages because we don't have that. The physical intimacy, the body language, the you know the nonverbal communication. So there is like a, an even greater anxiety at times with what does this text mean? You know, what, what are people's intentions? Um, which can be confusing and, and kind of anxiety provoking for people. Yeah, I mean, I know I've learned kind of a while ago to you know if I have a conflict with someone for sure, not to email it. <laughs> you know, because they don't they're not hearing my tone. They're not really getting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sense of, of, of me through that. Um, you know, another thing that relates to this also, I think is what happens when you're disconnected, you know, or what happens when somebody doesn't respond, you know, you're ghosted or people don't like your Facebook page or don't, you know what I mean? Or don't whatever, or not Facebook anymore. Maybe it's Instagram, whatever, but there, there's a sense in which, you know, there's a, you know, I've seen this where a lot of people have quite a despair. Mm-hmm. right from being from feeling like you've fallen off the earth because you're not noticed or attended to in some way online mm-hmm. and yeah and that might be a good kind of jump off because i think you know especially with the attachment piece porn can have a lot to do with rejection shame kind of that self-worth um 
and identity, right? Um, with, with the int- intimacy and longing for intimacy. So how do you see, <clears throat> how do you see those factors really play into people turning to porn you know, habitually? Yeah. 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 No, that's great. Um, I think shame is huge. Right. And, um, uh, I always think it's interesting. Um, uh, a lot of listeners might know who Brene Brown is. She's a, she's written. Uh, she's a well a PhD social worker who did her research on vulnerability and shame. And she did something interesting, which she defines shame as, um, uh, or guilt, um, guilt as I did something bad, and shame as I am bad. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. Uh, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. Um, but there's a dimension to the Catholic um, sense of shame, which adds to that actually, because it's not typically if I ran around my house naked, I don't feel ashamed, mm-hmm. right? But if for some reason I didn't notice I was naked and walked out my front door <laughs> in my neighborhood and people saw me, I would have a sudden bolt, you know, burst of shame. Like I, and it would be because I was seen. And so there's an element to shame that isn't just I'm bad or I'm worthless or something. It's I am seen as bad. Mm-hmm. I am seen as less than. And that becomes, that, that takes us into, into attachment theory, right? Because one of the main, one of the elements of really of, of secure attachment with others is to be seen mm-hmm. right and and to be valued in that yeah right um so shame is really the opposite of that mm-hmm. and so um when we when we're encountering other people and if they look at us or seem to be rejecting us or see us as less than or we interpret ourselves as being seen as less than, then that is an incredible amount of shame. And at a physiological level, even that level of shame tells the brain that you're in danger. Mm. Right? If you go back to our, our bodies are designed to con- like our brains are designed to connect with other people for survival. Mm. Is right there. You know, if we go way back in time, yeah. there would have been a time that, you know, we couldn't have done it alone. We had to, well, we still can't, but we have to, we, we would die of exposure. We'd die by wild animals. We would die if we were not connected. Yeah. So shame speaks to this primal need, right? Uh, survival need. Um, so that powerful. And, and especially like if you think about little kids, um, you know, or teens who don't yet know who they are, who are trying to fit in, who want to be seen as valuable and worthwhile and love, lovable and all this and, and interesting and worth looking at. Well, shame just completely annihilates that. Yeah. Right. And so what does pornography do? Well, it completely unconditionally constantly tells you, I want you. Hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't know what, unless, I mean, some point I, I understand, right, is, is, is abusive and it's, but even that is like, I want to abuse you because I want you, you know, you're an object of my desire. And so then, you know, that powerfully answers the question of shame, right? It, it's, of course, it's a lie because it's, you know, it's a distortion, but to the brain, it, it is exactly what the brain thinks it needs. Yeah. yeah. So once that happens, like once, you, like to me, addiction happens when a person has a terrible question that needs answered. Am I worth something? Will anybody look at me? Will anybody desire me? Will anybody want me? They ask this question. And they feel the answer is no. And then they look at pornography and pornography says, yes. Mm. That becomes something the brain remembers and stores as a powerful hit, like a drug. Yeah. Right. You might as well have a hit of heroin or eat a 
Whopper or or whatever. <laughs> like pick something yeah. <laughs> that that feels good, whether it's good for you or not. And then the brain will then, you know, you might get past that. Like you might have that experience looking at pornography and, 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 and well, then there's masturbation usually goes with it. And that also is, feels good. So now you've combined this answer of porn tells me I'm worth something and I'm desirable. Mm -hmm. Now it's paired, right? It's conditioned and paired with um, a, a powerful, good feeling physically good feeling uh, when again, not saying it's, it's, it's an objective moral good. It's just, it feels good. And then, and now, and then afterward though, a person goes back into shame because it's like, Oh, I did something wrong yeah. and they feel bad. Right. And they go about their, you know, and, and something else maybe happens that says uh, you're worthless. You're not good enough, whatever it is. And so it's a cycle again. Right. And, and that's the beginning of an addiction. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> and I like how you said that it's like that primal need for community that we're not, we can't do it alone because I think with porn, it could easily be classified as, Oh, you just want sex. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. But there is that the, the even broader need for intimacy that to feel secure, to feel seen, mm -hmm. to feel um, cared for, protected, to be able to share that it's not, just only like, Oh, I, I want to be with someone of, <clears throat> you know, the opposite sex and that's it. But it, it can be a lack of community, a lack of, of even that family or right. an intimacy of, with attachment. Well, there's no real intimacy in pornography at all. Yeah. I mean, there might, I mean, I suppose you could be in a, uh, uh, some simulation of it with chat rooms uh, yeah. or live chats or something like that. Where, where there's this, you know, where you are actually speaking to some other people, um, you know, and it can, for some, uh, it can lead to, you know, hookups and things like that. We actually are meeting another person. But even there, um, you're, when you're in that mode, right, where you're needing to answer that question and you're answering it through pornography, pornography definitely doesn't have real intimacy. But even then, it's still a self-focused um, need that's mm -hmm. being met and it's a deficit that's being um, filled in with something mm -hmm. so even in a in a regular you know whatever relationship with a real person <laughs> mm -hmm. one could still be doing that yeah right one could still enter into a relationship with a major deficit with a major feeling of I'm not worth anything and this other person is going to fill that need for me and the way they fill it is sexually yeah. and maybe not any other way, maybe in some other ways too. It's not rarely is it a hundred percent completely selfish, but still that is a, it's an understandable, but nevertheless selfish uh, way to be with others. Right. So the answer has to get back to um, what, how do I even know I'm worth anything? Hmm. How do I know my own value? Yeah. That has to get answered before you can tackle this addiction. There might be an element of just the pure biology and the pure physicality that one has to put, you know, boundaries around, mm -hmm. right? Because if that's already there, right? And like I said at the beginning, some of that is like a lot of that is just a natural curiosity, a natural physiological response to stimulus. But um, you can, if you're able to bracket that, you still have to answer this question. Um, because you, one has to know one's true value, one's true worth, in order to then give it to anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so we end up in addictive relationships where, where our codependent relationships, or however you want to put it, where each person is literally having the other person fill their deficits. And if it's if the only relationship is a pornograph is with pornography, then you don't really have another person. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a really good counterfeit for <laughs> that quick answer or wanting to answer that question. But but like you yeah. said, with the habitual use um, and in use, it, it there's that crash that follows, right? Because it's I've done something bad, and that might reinforce maybe that underlying belief of 
you know, where's my worth? Where's my purpose? Oh, well, I really don't have worth because look what I did. You know, it, it reinforces it. Exactly. Yeah. It, it creates a confirmation bias. Yes. Yeah. Now, now I believe the lie because I've now shown it's been affirmed. Yeah. 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 And I think like, uh, talked with Dr. Peter from souls and hearts, um, I think it was last week. Um, and we really talked about getting to the root of the problem, solving the right problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like how you said, you know, the behavioral stuff with, with pornography, um, there are really important behavioral boundaries to set in place. Right. Um, but we also have to be looking at solving the right problem, you know, getting to that, the root of that question that you said, um, yeah. which is so critical. And I think the Catholic faith, right. <laughs> is so, I mean, so key and critical in answering that question that, um, you know, right. we kind of hold the keys in our hands when we're, <laughs> when we're talking about where's my worth, where's my purpose, but yeah. being able to bring the gospel into the therapy um, healing process. So I, I guess my next question would be, what does that look like? You know, what is treating pornography, answering that question, finding out self worth, what does that look like within Catholic therapy? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good, great question. <laughs> um, so, so here's the thing that's interesting to me. Um, I, I, I see this with my, my clients all the time. It, it seems like, I don't know, if I had to guess, I'd say 90% of my clients, we come to this exact place. Yeah. Um, and I think deep down, the belief is um, that I, even God, would see me and, and, and think that I wasn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. They may know that's not true intellectually. They may know that their faith doesn't actually teach that, but that's what deep down is believed. Mm -hmm. So one can't even approach God really truly in prayer. And, and one has, and, and a person tends to feel that they have to somehow just be good. Mm -hmm. If I am just simply good. So I'm going to just stop looking at pornography mm -hmm. or I'm going to like, I don't know, whatever, eat right and exercise and, be nice to my neighbor. I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to go to mass every day and I'm going to pray the rosary. I'm going to do all these things and maybe, maybe, maybe God will like me mm -hmm. or tolerate me better. And, and then maybe I'll feel better about myself and I won't make these mistakes. And that is almost surely going to be a path to continual sin. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I do get people to um, do some reading. I get people to do prayer and reflection on this. And really, um, and I do some experiential things with people to encounter God in a different way. Um, you know, I, 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 I have the range. I love, I'm a big fan of St. Teresa of Avila mm -hmm. and her interior castle. I feel like she like literally describes what it is to go into the soul to understand one's true worth. And ultimately, one's true worth is grounded in Christ, who dwells in the Holy Spirit, who dwells within you. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm a Byzantine, I attend a Byzantine Catholic church. So, you know, there's a strong emphasis in the East, Eastern Christianity on, you know, that we're created in God's image and that we are growing more and more into his likeness through sanctification. Uh, so this concept of theosis, the fact is, you know, St. Teresa also would, would say, like, our dignity is unparalleled unparalleled that we are created in his image is 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 you know makes the angels envious mm -hmm. so we have a dignity where we're somehow we're because of our fallen nature and because of our fallen world and so on that we we we, we don't even know we don't really understand we don't even get yeah and what's cool about saint Teresa is that as as she goes into the soul as she explores the soul deeper and deeper um, this sense of the true dignity of, of the person grows and self-knowledge grows, but at the same time, humility grows. Mm -hmm. And humility truly is a right understanding of, of where you are with God. So you're not less than, you're not greater than you think mm -hmm. you are, and you're not less than you think you are exactly, yeah. you know, how God made you and, and redeemed you. Mm -hmm. um, and... And it's that humility that grows um, as one gets closer to it. People think, oh, you know, 
God loves me. I'm created in his image. I'm going to have pride or I'm going to, um, oh, it's more than I am or whatever. There's a false humility that could happen there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm, as we're talking about this, I'm just thinking of how many, how many things in life where <laughs> this, this question and, and really this forgetfulness of who we are and who God is, is at the root of it, right? Where it's, you know, I mean, original sin, right? We're, we're, we're separated. The concupiscence, we, we forget what, um, yeah, why we're here and, and our purpose and, and why God has created us and, and who God is. And, um, I think, you know, with, with porn, but with so many other issues too, we, we can become inoculated, right? And a lot of Catholics are, are easily inoculated to these truths, right? We hear, um, the truths of the faith and maybe they're presented in like hokey ways or we just hear it a lot and we just kind of take it for granted. But this idea that right. Jesus Christ died, yeah. for us, right? <laughs> God loves yeah. you. Yeah. And we're just like, yeah, well, that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll just take it in stride. Yeah. I think that could happen. It, it can have, it doesn't, it doesn't get solidified or it doesn't get, it doesn't, isn't made real. Yeah. Or it seems like a nice idea, but then if you knew me, you know, I don't live that at all or something. Yeah. Um, I do think one area of is, is salvation, as you mentioned. And it is interesting, right? Because um, Protestants will say, you know, we're saved by faith alone. We hear that a lot. Um, and they're pretty close to the truth there. Um, the, the St. Augustine really emphasizes we are saved, what St. Paul says, which is we are saved by grace alone. Mm. Now it's through faith yeah. that we access it, but we're saved by grace alone. And so um, that tells me there's absolutely nothing I can do to earn my actual salvation. Yeah. So, or justification, or however you want to term it, the, 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 the point at which God accepts you as his child right yeah. and there's absolutely nothing i can do there's no amount of going to mass or saying the rosary or or all the, th those are all good things mind you those are all good things to grow in holiness mm -hmm. yeah. but 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 they they don't make you worth something yeah and that's where people yeah. get i think catholics especially get really messed up yeah it's all and, and they good right it's like i should do this oh if, if god's gonna love me i i should be doing this and i should be doing that and it's like, or if you don't, it proves that you're, you're worth, you know, somehow yeah. worthless. The reality is what has to change that's hard is, and I'll say this to somebody who's struggling with pornography, God, Jesus Christ loves you. God loves you while you're looking at pornography. Yeah. Mm. If you can accept that, if you could hear that, if you could experience that, you would turn off that that phone or that laptop or whatever yeah and, and then even going to the cross jesus probably had an idea <laughs> right that that you might be there um and 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 looked at looked at all the mess even of porn and 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 looked at us individually and said we're we're still worth this right we're still worth the passion um you know and i i, I agree so much because i see so many of my clients, they come in and they do have this idea intellectually, like, oh yeah, God loves me and, and that's nice, but it's getting to that deeper level, right? It's getting from here to here and that's even in my own experience, my own conversion story. I mean, I was up here so much of my life with faith and it, and it really had to click on a deeper level and I could name some, some times in my life, but I think you know, what stood out to me is that there's that experiential part of it that we're experiencing God and experiencing healing in a very real way. And that we're not going to just only logically figure it out. Like, you know, um, this, this filter for porn plus this plus this equals no more porn, right? <laughs> it's like, it has to be that emotional factor, that very personal identity factor that's that's looked at and, and, and invited, inviting God into that, um, is huge. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so when, when, when one comes to Christ in that place, then it is, it is like the prodigal son, right? And it is like just a complete surrender. 
Mm. And when you experience God loving you anyway, Mm. that's what's redemptive. And that's what changes one's heart. And one might need to do that more than once. (laughs) not like it's not like like once and now uh, all of a sudden everything's gonna be perfect and all that physiological and attachment stuff i was talking about is now solved it won't be solved or it could be but it's not likely that it's going to be solved instantly it it takes time it's like any relationship you have to grow and develop it and nurture it and live in it yeah, it's like, oh, I said I love you to my wife on my wedding day. So that should be enough, right? It's, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, you always know that and keep that in mind. And <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just, <laughs> yeah, we, we need those reminders daily. Um, and to really, you know, I, I talked about it with Dr. Peter, to, to evangelize ourselves, to remind ourselves of the gospel message and to examine our images of God in all this too. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does some great stuff with God images. I yeah, think I like that a lot. Because really cool. yeah. we cool. have that. We, we, we have distorted views of God. Yeah. We have distorted views of others. We have distorted views of ourselves. I mean, that's what pornography is, right? It's a distorted truth. Um, that's where the devil gets us. Uh, he doesn't get us with a flat-out hell, hellfire. Mm-hmm. He gets us by showing us something we truly need, but mm-hmm. distorting it. Yeah. Right. So I really do need to, to be seen or I do need to be allowed in to see another. Well, what does pornography do? It totally distorts that. Right. It manipulates that. Um, you know, I want to feel comforted. Well, what does pornography do? It distorts. Yeah, you will feel comforted. There's a sense of physical pleasure that may take place, but it's going to be distorted. Yeah, and very short-lived <laughs> and very, right. unfi- you know, ultimately dissatisfying because it, you know, it's, it's that counterfeit. Right? Yeah, it's the brain being tricked to believe I have to have that now. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, and then it's short-lived. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So one question I, I want to ask is, you know, there are a lot of, of good Catholic couples and, and not Catholic couples where porn is is in the marriage in some form, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Usually the, the husband, but not always. And, you know, that that's kind of a really common dynamic we're seeing growing, right? Divorce rates having to do with porn. Um, right. how, how, would a, how would a couple navigate that in a relationship or even get preparing for a relationship? And I know you have a whole course on that. So <laughs> <laughs> this might be a question. Be true, recovering your marriage after the discovery of yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the, you know, there's like, I, uh, I don't even know how many, there, there are a lot of modules. <laughs> so uh, it, it takes a while to get through the course, so you get a lot more in depth. But I could say a few things about it, yeah. um, really. Um, I, I'll, I'll say um, a few pr- obstacles. One is there is more and more porn use among women, and the porn use among women is starting to shift so that it looks more like the porn use among men. It used to be that um you know men were sex addicts and women were love addicts if they were but now it looks different so uh, so i that's very um frightening to me i do think it's somewhat changing the biology of women to some extent to be more like men which is not a good thing um but anyway so it's 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 ubiqu- it's it's present um in, in, in among women as well um so even though the course that i did actually is geared like is kind of presented as if, like the man's the one who has the problem and the woman well they both have a problem but he has a problem with pornography and she's she's traumatized by it that is the majority but there are cases where it's the other way around or they're both using porn another thing i'll just say is um the younger generation now maybe it's not true among catholics as much but it may also be true among some Catholics, aren't even as stigmatized by the behavior. Mm-hmm. So there's a desensitization to it uh, also. In, in other words, if everybody is doing it and everybody's talking about it, you're not going to feel the same level of shame. Yeah. Um, so that's just another issue. Wow. So, so when you're talking about couples, those things are worth identifying mm-hmm. because um, you, know, the, you could have a wife who just doesn't even think it's a big deal. Or you could have a husband that doesn't think it's a big deal and the wife is extremely bothered by it, right? And he doesn't understand what, why she's, she's having trouble with it. 
Um, so the, the, a lot of different dynamics that could be happening, mm -hmm. right? But ultimately, here's the thing. Um, as I was trying to mention before, it's sad to say, I don't know that a lot of couples, married, say, let's just say married heterosexual couples, um, are actually able to live a healthy sexual life. Yeah. Right. Even, even ones that want to, like it's, it, it, because of our fallen world, because of how pornography has influenced people, because of just the way our society views sex as a commodity yeah. and the way that society views human beings as objects, you know, um, it's, it has to affect, it affects most people even good Catholics. Yeah. So um, if pornography is present, then it automatically indicates a problem with one's sexuality and the way one views it mm -hmm. as something that I have to have my need met and I have to use someone or something or some object in order to be gratified. So right there, we have a whole way of looking at sex that is unhealthy and uncatholic. Mm -hmm. True. So, it would, yeah, there's the behavior. So if a couple is committed, hey, uh, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we know the pornography being present is a symptom yeah. of a bigger problem in the marriage and a bigger problem in one's sexuality is one that honestly most couples have. Yeah. So um, <laughs> even, if it, even if they're not looking at porn. Yeah. So, so let's just put that all in perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit and say then how do we create real intimacy that leads to healthy sexuality mm -hmm. is the bigger bigger question and that's why my course is actually um, you know I do a lot of kind of basics of intimacy and marriage stuff in that course it isn't just all talking about sex or something mm -hmm. um, even though obviously we do um, and what, so what's that course called again so if they go to the website yeah, they go to the website, soulsandhearts.com, and look at courses. There's one called Be True, Restoring Your Marriage After the Discovery of Pornog a Pornography Issue, long title. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, and uh, so, so really, it's that question of how do we create real intimacy with another person? First, the person has to be in the room. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some basic things like making eye contact and being willing, able to be vulnerable and being able to talk about what's difficult and what's hard and yeah. knowing that the other person will care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And, it, and it's going back to that, the, the question again, too, within marriage of, you know, like, where is my worth? Where am I being seen? And am I, am I being accepted or am I being seen in my marriage and am I being rejected or, you know, is it right. that way? So having that play out within the relationship dynamic is, is huge. And, and, being able to, like you said, lay the proper framework for intimacy, for sexual intimacy, um, looking at that question and kind of examining the relationship itself. Um, yeah. No, you just reminded me of what I wanted to say before, so thank you. <laughs> Which is, you know, like I was describing coming to a relationship or, or a computer screen with a deficit that needs to get answered. Um, when it is answered, right? If two people are coming into a relationship with deficits, they're like, I need you and you, I need you to tell me who I am to make me feel good about myself and vice versa. Right. That's going to be inherently a codependent relationship. Um, but if, if both people, you know, obviously it's a growth, no one's hundred percent there, but if both people know who they are, mm -hmm. right. They know their how beautifully made they are. They know their talents. They know they're, they're a gift. They know they are, uh, created in love by God the Father and love by Him, and they they know their weaknesses too, and they've accepted those. You know what I mean? They they're a whole person, right? And they're encountering another whole person. Mm. And we've got two people who are affirming and loving that reality in each other, yeah, and wanting it to grow to its fullness. Mm -hmm. Whoa! Now we've got a growth affirming, a growth fostering relationship. And it's powerful. And then it gets expressed sexually. It is the best sex ever. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's two people, not like we're done. We figured it out, but it's two people constantly doing their own work and kind yeah. of knowing who they are, 
preaching the gospel to themselves, being that to their spouse, looking at their own weaknesses, their own faults. Um, yeah. It's that ongoing process like sanctification, right? Or, you know, becoming more and more like Christ. Uh, how, how beautiful that is. Um, maybe how rare that is, but, but, but also kind of how possible that is. And, and that might be the last question is, you know, as we're talking about all this, you know, I know porn mm -hmm. is, is such a heavy thing for people to carry, right? Um, it's a heavy burden. It feels um, despairing, right? Um, to yeah. carry it. And so where, where's the hope, I guess, in the wrapping this all up, where's the hope? Where's the peace when we're saying, let's look at porn addiction? Well, I, as I said before, it's a symptom. Mm -hmm. It's not an identity. So, um, and what does the symptom do? It can tell us there's something sick. There's something wrong. So how about let's not just pathologize it. Let's just not, let's certainly not shame people. Let's just face the facts. I don't know. I've never met a man who hasn't at least had some experience with pornography. I don't, if, if there's somebody out, some guy out there, I don't know who you are. We want to meet you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell, how did you get through unscathed, right? And so, uh, so, so it's ubiquitous, really. And so, um, we, we need to accept the fact that if it pro becomes a problem, right, where it becomes something that becomes a pattern in one's life, then that's a symptom. And that's, thank goodness, because that will then tell you you need to, have, you need to get help and you need to, to um, you know, to work on what I'm talking about, which is about developing and creating real intimacy. So the healing and the hope is that that is what God offers us. Mm -hmm. there, we all are capable of it. We're all made for it, in fact. So no, no matter how bad the addiction is or how it doesn't matter whether, you know, like whether it's become something really big in your life or whether it's just if it's a, a problem, a recurring problem that's limited, you know, to, I don't know, just pornography as opposed to acting out in other ways. Mm -hmm. It all doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Because we're all called to something more. We're all called to, to, sure. to be truly children of God. And so let's not live in shame but let's respond to it right um it's an opportunity mm -hmm. i love right? it yeah and within relationships right it becomes an opportunity for the relationship to get better mm -hmm. yeah we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures we are john paul right <laughs> yeah that's that's so important that you are not defined by your sin um, and in fact, sin is boring. Sin is old, right? It's, <laughs> and there's nothing new under the sun um, that, you know, as far as sin. And, yeah. and so I think finding our identity, reminding ourselves our identity isn't in that, like you said, is so, so important that it's, it's pointing to that deeper question that, that we are made for more and, and we are made for, for someone, right? And oh, yeah, that's, that's a really good, good hope that you're not alone. Um, you're, you're not your your porn use you know you're not um yeah lies that we can buy into with this yeah good stuff yeah well thank you so much for for being on and uh you know this has been a really good conversation and i hope if you're watching this this is helpful and i uh, just want to encourage anybody watching it to comment below hit that like button subscribe um, we'll have emails links in the bio um, for for dr jerry and especially for his his course on dealing with uh, porn especially within uh, marriage and relationships so please check that out and um, dr jerry where can they reach you i guess is there any social media or any other place oh yeah well um on well souls and hearts right dot com is is our website but uh and, and souls and hearts does have a twitter okay it's so one and an instagram and we're on facebook uh and uh so all that that lovely stuff and uh and i have uh my own practice transfiguration and counseling dot com okay cool. also and we have a, a group of christian uh counselors there and, and a life coach it's all good okay. Thank, All right. you. Thank you again. And thanks everyone for watching and God bless. All right.